Sanctuary. Can you guys help me to welcome Pastor Erna? I got you. Thanks, Pastor Tanisha. She's gone this week. She was uh, doing a retreat for uh, Young Life. And uh, I'm so lonely without her when she's gone. She's not here. You know what? Worship already has me too hot for my blazers. So. All right, beautiful saints of God. Let me just look at you for a minute. Yes, I see you, beautiful people. All right, if you need a Bible, our ushers will hand them to you. Um, today we are going to be talking about growing up in God, having a spiritually and emotionally mature relationship with God. So we are doing this series, The Ties That Bind. We've been talking a lot about skills that will help us have emotionally mature relationships in our family, with our friends, with our coworkers. But also, let's, I want us to be talking about, it's not just about relationships with others, but helping our relationship with God mature. And as I was walking my dog this morning as a do, um, I was just praying and I was like, God, what do you want? You know, what's your word for the people today? And I felt like God was just said to me, tell them that I want more in my relationship with them. That, and I felt like it wasn't like a chastisement, but more an invitation that we're settling, that there's more. And I think sometimes when we hear about like, oh, let's get have a more mature relationship, we feel like that means like, let's have less fun and be more uptight in the name of the Lord. But I don't think that's what it is. I actually think there's so much more freedom and enjoyment and depth that we can experience in our life with God. And um, I felt like, uh, you know, God was bringing to mind just my relationship with my mom. So if you watch like, you know, if you watch people parenting, um, you know, I lived with my godchildren uh, for probably 14 years in the same house, right? So I watched, I was in the room when they were born in, in the hospital and, you know, saw them through every phase. And you know, when they're really little, you know, they wake up all the time, they need to be held and cared for. And then when they become toddlers, it's kind of like a crazy, toddler phase is a crazy phase because now they're mobile with zero wisdom, right? So you feel like their life's work is to like throw themselves off the stairs, like electrocute themselves, you know, just like sticking their fingers in like the electrical sockets. And I feel like the parents of toddlers, their entire life is like, no, no. No, that will kill you. Also, this will kill you. But like the toddler just feels, and um, I think we can go through a phase like that in our life with God. You know, like when we first start following God, he's trying to be like, probably don't do that. Also, that might kill you. <laughs> also, maybe not this. But as a parent, wouldn't you be sad if your child never grew past that phase? Right, so then, then you want them to grow past like, okay, so they're not like throw, hurling themselves into the street and off the stairs. You know, and then you go through what I like, what I think of as the very emotionally stable junior high years. <laughs> and I think the internet is really helping with that. Um, but that's a different, you know, it really, it, it, was, it was really a sweet phase though because, okay, they could dress themselves, they were going to school, and now they're suddenly navigating relationships with their friends. I remember my godson, he, um, he got bullied, right? He got bullied because he would always tuck his shirt into his athletic shorts, which had like this elastic <laughs> waistband. And it, it wasn't the coolest look that you ever saw in all of your life. And it was before, it was not the French tuck because the French tuck is, is cool. <laughs> and, um, but it was a sweet moment because his little brother who actually always had a lot of friends at school during that season, started tucking his shirt into his shorts in solidarity with his brother. It's a very sweet thing to see. And, um, but then it was also sweet to see them grow up into high school, you know, where they started making more choices about who they were gonna be friends with. And then, you know, my oldest godson, when he went to college, I went to visit him, and it was exciting to see him trying to figure out what kind of major he was going to, to where he was gonna focus his energy, and you know, choices he was gonna make now that he was outside of his parents' house. And growing in maturity and then how he related with his parents. You know, in the early years, it's just don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. But as you get older, he could ask deeper questions about more significant issues, right? Not just like, should I drink this poison that is next to the washing machine or not? But it's more like questions like, how do I 
know what my what I should major in and like what my calling is. Growing in maturity and having a maturing relationship with our parents, which not all of us have, right? Some of us would be like, Ugh. I have not moved into all those phases with my parents for a variety of reasons, but ideally that would happen. But we get stunted in our life with God. We, I think particularly because there's this thing, uh, Dallas Willard calls it the gospel of sin management, where basically the whole, we talk about Christianity, like the whole thing that God is concerned with is that toddler phase. No, don't do this. No, don't do that. No, don't do this. No, don't do that. That's it. And we talk about all of our life with God, like that's all God is interested in. But actually, God wants us to mature past that phase. So you, he's not excited. But, I mean, he'll do it because he wants to keep you alive. But he, too, is excited about what a more mature relationship with you could look like. And so I want to talk about how we can move through different seasons and phases of our life with God. Amen? All right, so that's what we're going to do. When I, uh, the scripture we have actually comes, the reason I started thinking about this was because I looked at the lectionary, and the lectionary is Psalm 145, verse 1 and 2, and it says, I will extol you, my God and King. Bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. In the message version, it says, I lift you high in praise, my God, oh my King. I'll bless your name into eternity. I'll bless you every day. I'll keep it up from now until eternity. And I thought, what would it have to be true about my life with God to be able to say, I could just praise you every day forever? Because that sounds like a good thing to say. Like, mm, oh, I just praise God until eternity. But honestly, I feel like I might run out of stuff before eternity. I might run out of stuff after like a week or two or a month or two. Beca and I think about what my Im image of why that might happen. And I remember when I was growing up, the image I had of heaven was very boring. I don't know if y'all like grew up in like with, I grew up in the 80s. And it, heaven was just like, like little fat babies angels and then everybody and it was all white people so it was like I was like it's a suburb and um of like all white people in robes just looking bored and I was like oh my gosh so heaven is fat babies and bored white people I don't know if I can stay there forever lord but it was but there's supposed to be this like dynamic like I'm gonna praise you forever and ever but then the images I had I was like that doesn't that looks very stagnant like not a forever and ever dynamic thing. And I think it's because that image doesn't capture that life with God is this ongoing discovery and mystery. And I think it's because a way that we come into, the way we talk about life with God often isn't about ongoing maturing relationship, but about conversion. It's about a moment and then belief in 10 things that can be listed on a piece of paper. You know, so it's like, I convert. When I convert, I believe these 10 things, and I never have to change them, and they never evolve, and 10 years from now, I just have to believe the same 10 things. Does that, does that sound familiar to anyone? That's not very dynamic, and I don't think it's true to what life with God is supposed to be, but it's a little bit what's been put out there for us. You know, and so I think about the fact that, like, what if, like, when I got married to my husband, I was like, we got married, and I was like, I agree, we're gonna be married. We had a wedding ceremony, and I was like, cool, so we're done now, right? And then I was like, and we never had another date night, and I was like, I'm not necessarily gonna like live in the same house as you, because we got married, and it's cool, I did the ceremony. No, that doesn't make any sense, right? That's not gonna have, I'm not gonna have a thriving marriage if that's how I approach it, but sometimes that's how we approach life with God. Instead of something we continue to invest in. And so I was like, who can we look at um, whose life with God continues to evolve that we can learn some lessons from. And so I thought, let's go take a look at the life of Moses. Shall we? Can we look at the life of Moses for a little bit? And let's look at some scenes. Are we warm? I can't tell if we're warm because we're preaching or because we did have the heat on, but now we've become too hot. How's our temperature, saints of God? Are we okay? Okay, let's go do warm. Can we just come down a tiny couple degrees because I need the saints to be alert and I cannot have the heat fighting God's purposes. All right. So, let's look at the life of Moses. Hmm, hmm, hmm. And look at some uh, phases that he went through. Now, these phases aren't totally linear. I think that we move in and out of them. But Exodus 2, when we, early on when we meet Moses, it says, Time passed, Moses grew up, 
right? So he's a Hebrew uh, child while the Hebrews are enslaved to Egypt. And one day he went and saw his, uh, saw his brothers. He saw all that hard labor. Then he saw an Egyptian hit a Hebrew, one of his relatives. So he himself has been growing up in the palace. So he himself is not a slave. But he sees, he sees himself as a Hebrew, and he sees someone getting treated unjustly, and he has like a strong justice instinct. But it's a justice instinct that's, that he responds differently. Because he hasn't been in slavery, he's like, oh, someone's being treated unjustly. I can definitely murder someone as a response to this. That is not the response of someone who's been marginalized. So he, it says, he then looked this way and then that. When he realized there was no one in sight, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. I appreciate your instinct against injustice. I don't know if that murder was like the right first way to go. And I call this phase making bad decisions and derailing your own life. And many of us have been in this phase or seen people be in this phase, and this is an easy phase to get stuck in. Because often what happens when you're in this phase is the one mistake you made also leads to another, and then you have to do the next thing. For example, like, if you, are, if you deal with lying, well, when you lie, what do you have to do? Keep lying. Or when you steal, then you have to do this other thing to keep it up. Or if you cheat, oh, you cheat on that test, then you have to lie, and then you gotta remember your lie, and then you, you know what I'm saying, right? It's like, when you start making one problematic decision, it just leads to a series of other problematic decisions. And so our life with God, this is fine. He's not mad. He'll show up for us. But this is the phase where it's the, like, he, it's the toddler phase. Like, maybe stop doing that. That's going to get you or somebody else hurt. Maybe, hey, maybe stop doing that. That's going to get you and someone. Maybe, and then all of your prayers are, please get me out of trouble, God. Please get me out of trouble, God. I was wondering if you get me out of trouble, God. Hey, I haven't talked to you for a while, but could you get me out of trouble? Our life with God can't mature when we keep ourselves in constant crisis because we keep making bad decisions that derail our own life. That's a phase. Have we ever been in that phase or seen people we love in that phase? Only one person. <laughs> so that's Moses. So Moses, as a result of his bad decisions, we don't want to be stuck there. We don't want to see him stuck. He runs away, leaves Egypt. He is on the run. And Exodus 2, 21 says, Moses agreed to settle down there with the man. Jethro, who becomes his father-in-law, who gave his daughter Zipporah to him for his wife. She had a son, and Moses named him Gershom, or sojourner, saying, I'm a sojourner in a foreign country. So he flees, and his justice instinct is still in place because he actually flees to this other country, and he sees some women being harassed, and he tries to step in and defend them, and that actually pulls him into this family, and he marries a daughter from this family and then becomes um, a shepherd. Now, this, um, this phase is what I like to call adulting and ordinary time. <laughs> so Moses gets out of his derailing phase because he escapes it. And what he is learning here is how to work a job that is kind of boring and routine. Now, you have to remember how bougie Moses is. Moses grew up in the palace. He's not Mr. like I learned to punch a time clock kind of guy. So learning to just be a shepherd who every day is doing mundane stuff, there's a little bit of character formation happening there. It's not flashy, right? It's not like in one moment. It's the kind of formation that happens in very boring and routine ways. He also gets married and is learning how to be a husband, and is learning how to be a dad, which is pretty routine. Children are not like, every day is extraordinary and different. No, with children it's like, today you will have to fight me to get dressed, also you will fight me to feed me, then you'll fight to get me to school, and then you'll pick me up and I will fight you about food again, and then we will try to make you go to bed like we didn't do this last night, and you will fight me again, and then you finally go to sleep. Let's do that again for eight and a half years. Right? It's very, very routine. But there's a kind of formation that happens to showing up consistently, to doing his job, to being a husband, to being a dad, to being a son-in-law, to getting some of those impulses under control. 
And I was reading, um, I was reading uh, this book called Listening for God by Renita J. Weems. She is very excellent. She is like a foremost womanist theologian, and I love her. And she talks about ordinary time. And if you look at the Christian calendar, we're about to head into one part of the calendar, which is Advent, right? Getting ready for the birth of Jesus. So that's like a, that's a um, very active moment. That's like a religious holiday season of preparation and celebration. And then there's Lent to Easter. And then there's the season heading towards Pentecost. But here's what she says. For more than seven months out of the year, the human spirit is left to scramble for itself. Life must be lived outside of the feasts and the fasts of the Christian calendar. And believers are expected to figure out for themselves how to calibrate and celebrate mystery. I think that we always want every day to be about extraordinary time. But there is something about moving towards mature relationship with God that knows how to be consistent in ordinary time. And so let me read a little bit more from, from her reflections on this. This is a great, listening for God, a minister's journey through silence and doubt. She said, when I when in seminary, I first learned about ordinary time. Um, I, belonging as I have most of my life to what some would call low church traditions where emphasis is less on liturgy and more on the gathered congregation, I had no language to talk about times when God felt silent. Reading an old journal entry of mine in August 1987, my eyes fell upon these words. I'm not mad at God, I just don't have anything to say to God. Looking back on this period of my life when I was still in school, trying to finish a dissertation, trying to get a job, had recently had my heart crushed by unreciprocated love, I felt alienated from God's affection. As far as I was concerned, God became silent first. My silence was in response to God's silence. I talked to people who talked to me, I wrote in my journal. I was indignant at God's silence, but I was also afraid of it. I wondered what I had done. So here, I tell myself that if ordinary time had been a part of my religious psyche, I might have been spared blaming myself for years when my spiritual journey was lackluster and God felt far away, I could have relaxed in the notion that God's silence didn't mean God's absence. Can I say that again? I could have relaxed in the notion that God's silence didn't mean God's absence. That for the believing heart, the silence of God is precisely the way God is present. So I think Moses is in an extended season of ordinary time where he is learning to stay out of trouble and stay present to the daily routines of life. And this season goes on for years. Now this is an important season of formation. Like I say, it's not flashy, but it's important. But it's also easy to get stuck here because you know what? You're adulting. You're like reasonably successful. You're employed. You're married. You have your kids. Society might be like, cool. So it's easy to just be like, all right, I'm functional. I'm more functional than my parents, so <laughs> I'm cool. So then this is what's interesting is because God wants a deeper transformational relationship. So Exodus 3, it says, Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horeb. The angel of God appeared to him in flames of fire in the middle of the bush. He looked. The bush was blazing, but it didn't burn up. So this, I think, I call this phase curious and willing to experience more. Because this is a disruption to his ordinary life. And what for him at one point was a challenge to show up for, now God's bringing a little bit of disruption. And, but Moses has to stop. See, it's not God, it doesn't say Moses walked by a bush that wasn't burning and God was like, Moses, Mo Moses, I am in this, Mo Moses. That's not what happens. The bush is burning and he stops and he looks at it, 
and he's curious about it. And then God says, why don't you come closer? I think curiosity and uh, being open to interruption is like a highly unacknowledged part of life with God. Again, because if we come from this very Western and false view of what life with God is, it's just believing these 10 things. You learned them when you were eight years old and there's nothing out to learn. Then when you see the burning bush, you'd be like, that doesn't fit into this list. But if you understand that life with God is this ongoing relationship, and see, even this list idea contradicts one of our foundational beliefs, which is we say God is like all-knowing, so expansive, can speak creation into existence. God exists in this period of time while also existing in this period of time while also existing in the future. He also exists in the past. Like he knows you individually but also knows you individually in a way that is not impressive uh, or oppressive. It is impressive. It is not oppressive, right? Is mysterious, is hidden, is doing things you cannot fathom, right? And yet we're like, but I got you on lock with these 10, this list of 10 core beliefs. That's ridiculous. If we believe that God is this unending mystery, then our curiosity is always stirred. Could I be knowing more of you over here? Are you in this bush? And God is like, in fact, I am. <laughs> Curious and willing to experience more. Getting unstuck from the routine of everyday adulting and life which at one point was a great goal for him to reach, but now is going to be stagnation if he doesn't keep evolving. So Exodus 4, right? He's like, hey, I've got this plan. I'm going to set like the Hebrew people free. I want you to be a big part of that. And Moses repeatedly is like, no, that seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> and God's like, no, I really, like I'm going to be with you. And Moses is like, no, I'm such a bad speaker. No. And God's, and God's like, God said, who do you think made the human mouth? I just love this kind of trash talk with God. And who makes some mute and some deaf and some sighted and some blight? Isn't it I? Like, imagine, it's me. I do that. <laughs> so get going. I'll be right there with you, with your mouth. I'll be right there to teach you what to say. He said, this is Moses, Oh, master, please send somebody else. Now, even though this is sort of like a tense and frustrating back and forth, and you see God get angry with Moses, I actually think this is a deeply mature interaction because this is a conversation. And Moses keeps bringing his insecurities to God, and God keeps engaging with Moses about it. So this isn't like a toddler interaction. It isn't just like, I want you to go. I don't want to go. It's not that. I don't want to go. Moses, don't you know I'm going to be with you? Actually, in fact, I don't. This engagement, actually, this willingness to keep talking to God about his insecurities is actually a more mature relationship. Even when it leads to God being frustrated with him, it is actually an important place to go. Because if we stay stuck in that either you know, toddler phase or a phase where God is just like, I only show up when I need you to give me something, we never get to this deeper conversational, transformational phase. We never really talk to God. When we feel the resistance, we go silent because we don't realize he wants more engagement from us. And so what I love about this is that he stops and looks at the bush. He's curious, and he's going to encounter more of God. But when you encounter more of God, you do have to do more of your own work. And so that's why all his insecurities come up, right? Like he didn't need to address all these insecurities while he was out here shepherding sheep. But God's like, hey, I actually have this, this calling on your life, this invitation for you to be part of what I'm doing. And all these insecurities he, hadn't, he didn't have to deal with just come raging up. But God is willing to address that. So there's always this, his own emotional maturity is going to grow as his life with God grows, as his sense of what he's supposed to be doing in this world grows. They all keep growing together, right? This relationship. And I think that this is an important phase to talk about because I think that this is a phase, as now that I'm in my 40s and I shall be turning 44 on Tuesday. <laughs> 
not afraid of getting older. Yes, 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 yes. Woman in her 40s is happy. All right. I just need to testify because our whole culture is like fear getting older. I love it. It's great. It's fantastic. So let me just testify. But what I see happening to a lot of folks in their 30s and 40s is, okay, you learned how to stay out of trouble. You learn how to feed your children on a daily basis. But then you, you, you are still, there's still one or two very deep core issues that you can't just sort of behavior change your way out of them. They're usually kind of these deeper compulsions. All right, and so it's, it's, and you probably can hide them. You've learned to hide them. But if we could lay bare your inner world, we would see it's a hot mess in there. And I would say it looks like this, a compulsive need to do things perfectly. A compulsive need to be in control. A compulsive need to be right, yes, a compulsive need to avoid conflict, yes. a compulsive need to be needed. Yes. I could name a few more, but you hit this phase and you're like, yes, I am adulting. Yes, I am doing whatever. And I, because Moses gets married, I don't want the subtext to be, you can't really move into maturity if you don't get married. I think being, uh, being rooted in God in being single is also takes deep formation. That's just what happens to Moses. But I don't want the subtext to be like, oh, if you're single, you're on hold for the next level of maturity. That's a false narrative often spoken in the church, and I don't believe that. Whatever in this season, being able to continue to have deep conversations, show up consistently, and stay in the routine of that, because singleness can also be its own kind of routine, and showing up to that steadily is part of our maturity. But people hit this phase, and then there's still this internal compulsion. So you're either, the need to be the hero, right? The need, whatever, it doesn't necessarily le look like bad behavior externally, but it isn't fully conformed internally. And this is, I think this is part of what's happening for Moses, is God's trying to get in here to this compulsive insecurity that he has and do some work with it. It wasn't showing up in his daily life. God could have left Moses alone in it for the rest of his life. But God wanted to get in there. For you to know more of me and for you to live into your purpose, you also gonna have to do some deeper work with these compulsions. Does that make sense? So that is what is happening there. And so he needs to know God more deeply. And in order to do that deeper work, he needs to know how to have this more rigorous back and forth conversation. Amen? So he goes and he, um, he uh, you know, is part of God setting the Israelite people free. And I'm not going to go back and forth or, or do that section um, because there's a lot of movies and cartoons dedicated to that section of the story. But on the other side of the people getting liberated, now you have to imagine, all right, if you are Moses at this point, you feel, you could feel like pretty awesome about yourself. You did just partner with the living God in manifesting some of the most insane signs of his power that like the world has ever seen. And then you led his people to liberation and freedom. It's pretty awesome. So they're out here in the desert, and his father-in-law shows up. And he could, when he meets his father-in-law, whose sheep he used to tend, feel like, I kind of outgrew you, Jethro. I'm kind of big time. I'm sort of leading a whole people now, right? He could be this guy. So in Exodus 18, it says, the next day Moses took his place to judge the people. People were standing before him all day long, from morning to night. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what's going on here? Why are you doing all this all by yourself, letting everybody line up before you from, it says moving, but from morning to night? I'm sorry, is that correct? Ah, daylight savings, okay. I was like, have I been preaching for an hour and a half? It doesn't seem like it. Um, so basically what's happening is now that they're out of slavery and they're like in the desert, every day people have like different, you know, issues between them, conflicts, and they line up all day so that Moses can be like, 
Okay, uh, Tanisha, actually, yes, you do have to pay that person $50. Okay, do, do each person. Uh, okay, uh, yes, that was actually, you did do Lauren Dirty, give her your base. Right, you know, like each little thing, sorting it out, sorting it out. And his father-in-law comes along and is like, how you're leading the people right now, this is not the best way. Now think about, as a leader, how easily Moses could be like, oh, really? Shepherd, father-in-law, you want to critique my leadership? Oh, you must not have heard. I did recently lead the liberation of my people from slavery. What feedback did you want to give me? But that's not Moses' response. Even after great success, there is this humility that he stays teachable. Particularly, I think it's interesting that he stays teachable who, to somebody who basically he could dismiss as from his small podunk hometown, who doesn't understand the big world he's living in now. I think I did this for a few years with my aunt and my mom. Like I went off to college and I like lived in the world and my mom and my aunt, you know, like especially my aunt, you know, they like didn't speak English very fluently. Like they were, and I just sort of felt like they can't really like speak to my experience. This was some colonized evil that I had let internalize into my soul. I'm not proud of this phase. <laughs> but then there came a point where I real, like I've sort of felt like, you know, you can't speak to all the things I know to, coming back around to a deeper humility to please teach me how to live on this earth with your wisdom. How you survived and can maintain your life with God after all the trauma you've been through. And that's what Moses is holding on to. Yes, I've seen some things, but I still need my mentors. I still need humility. I still need to be formed. And I think that sometimes when we take on leadership and responsibility and our discipleship has more of an upfront role, we stop being teachable. And that is toxic. And what I think is mature here is his willingness to continue to grow and learn. And the kind of leader you were to get your people out of Egypt is not the kind of leader they need here in the desert. And so what worked here, and again, if we just align ourselves with a list of 10 things, we just think if we're like, Jesus died for my sins, that's all I need to know. Okay, but that's true. But don't you think 20 years later what you understand about the cross and what it's doing in this world should be expanding and evolving? Or should it still be the same thing you learned when you were in third grade? Maybe God wants to expand your understanding. So that's what I love about this phase of Moses' life. And then I'm going to end with one final snapshot, which I think is just an invitation and a challenge. Does anyone know why Moses is not allowed to go into the promised land? Do you all remember this? Sister Daisy's like, I know. <laughs> it's really interesting. I want us to look at this. So in Exodus 17, basically what happened, they're in the desert, no water, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Getting water to thousands and thousands of people in the desert on a daily basis is a logistical difficulty. And so when they would run out of water, there's a lot of anxiety. So Exodus 17 says, then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And water comes out of the rock. And God provides water for the people. Great, great story. A year or two later... The story is told in Numbers 20. Moses and Aaron went out from the assembly to the entrance of the tent and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff. You and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of the rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. And water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. And as a result of that action, right, because God tells him to speak to the rock, 
But what does he do? Strikes it. And God goes, because of that, you're not going to go into the promised land. And I think we need to think for a minute about, that seems pretty cold. <laughs> I want you to process for Why do you think, one, why do you think Moses does that? Why doesn't he speak to the rock? Why does he tap it? And why is the consequence so significant? Talk to each other for a moment. I really want you to think about it. So why? Why does he do that? All right, do you have some thoughts? I think there's a lot that's challenging about this, but I'll just share m my thought, which is I think that Moses taps the rock because tapping the rock is what worked last time. And that was, in fact, what God told him one time, but it's not what God told him this time. And we are so interested in a result versus relationship. We're so interested in a technique that will get us the outcome we want and get us out of the stressful situation that we're in versus an ongoing, submissive, dynamic relationship with God where we're listening to him and willing to have the humility yeah, that's what worked last time. But it's not just about what worked last time. It's about what I am trying to tell you this time. Now, God's so generous. God isn't like, no water for all the people because you hit the rock. God is gracious. He missteps. Water still comes forward. But then God pulls Moses aside and said, I love you. You are an amazing leader. And in his legacy, it says... God talked with Moses face to face unlike almost any other person in the history of Israel. But even when you're a great leader, it is about ongoing humility and listening and relationship. Just like if you say to a friend, you know, like, okay, well, last time you were sad when I gave you a hug and fed you pie, it worked. But if your friend is literally like, don't Feed me pie and hug me this time. This time I need you to like help me write this letter and get into therapy. And you're like, but hugs and pies worked last time. Be like, but we are in an ongoing and evolving relationship. I need you to stay present to what's going on right now. And you were like, no, hugs and pies worked. I'm going to write a book on hugs and pie. We're going to have hugs and pie conference. We're just going to be hugs and pie church. And that's all we're doing forever. That's how Christianity works. It's like it worked once. We're going to stay that way forever versus on going, maturing, listening, and transformation. And so God is, God is trying to have a, di he's trying to do a thing with the people of Israel, but he's always trying to have an ongoing relationship with Moses. And it's not enough that there was this success coming out of Israel. It's not enough that there was this success in setting up a better administrative system. It's not enough that there was a success here. It's about right now. And we always want to get out of the dependency and humility of relating to go to an easier to do system that we can replicate. And this is gonna be just my closing, closing exhortation. Do you know that we have only explored 5% of the ocean? Like when I, go to the, when I go to the beach and stuff, I look out there, I feel like it's a great analogy for God, right? Because I'm like, yes, you are touching right up on the shore, but you are vast and deep and you're powerful 
right? Like I, when the first time <laughs> my freshman year, I, it, you don't swim in the ocean in the Pacific Northwest because it's cold. So when I went to college in LA and they took us to the beach for the first time, I was like, literally, I was like, I'm gonna live my Southern California dream. And I just ran full speed from the car across the beach. It, and I didn't understand how to handle waves. So literally, I got full body slapped by a wave and then just thrown into like a, a sandy like embankment, just face, you know, rolling on the sand. And I stood up and I was like, this is not the California dream that I had envisioned, but it did increase my respect for the ocean significantly. <laughs> and what I would say is God is like the ocean. I think the ocean actually is an analogy for life with God, which is, don't be satisfied with just this small percentage that you know. 5% is so little, right? And we actually know some awesome things about the ocean. Have you ever looked at like coral reefs? Like that business is crazy. And then there's like deep, deep ocean exploration where literally there's like fish that grew lamps out of their heads. <laughs> like God was like, I'm gonna hide this thing super deep. Nobody's gonna believe it. Let's put a lamp on this thing's head. We'll just put it real dark that they won't find this thing for thousands of years. And then they literally, and that's what happened. God is like that. We know 5% of God, and then we just settle. But what if we have more of an of a explorer type of relationship with God, where we realize there's so much more beauty and mystery to experience? There's so much more of God to know. You know God in the chaos, but do you know him in the stillness? You know God in the streets, but do you know him in the streams and in the redwoods and in the hills? You know God as a father, but do you know her as a mother? You know her in the loudness of a worship song, but do you know her in the silence? You know Jesus who saves, but do you know Jesus who sustains? And if you know Jesus who sustains, do you know Jesus who is breaking generational chains? You know the Lord that has brought you this far, but are you ready to meet the God who will take you on the next leg of your journey? Let us be dissatisfied in a godly way that we only know 5% of the ocean, that we only know a small percent of the living God, and that we don't need to settle for a toddler relationship with God, but we could have a maturing, dynamic relationship of real conversation, of deeper transformation, of coming into deeper purpose, not just settling for routines. And not just living off of one success that we experienced here, but in an ongoing way, experiencing something new of God every day. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. God, we want more of you. God, we want more of you. We want more of you, God. We want more of you. We don't want to settle for a list of 10 things we agree to. We want a dynamic and transformational, ongoing, humbling, challenging, dynamic life with you. We don't want to settle for the small bit of you we've experienced where the ocean touches the shore, but we want to go deep. I just want to, if, if maybe as you're listening, if you feel like, yes, God, I, I have settled for a, a less growing and mature relationship with you that I could have, then I just, right now, where you are, you can put your hands out in front of you and just say, pray, ask for more, begin that conversation with God. And you might say, I want more, and then he might say something back to you about that. Let's be able to listen to that. Great thing to repent of. I'm sorry, God. I got stuck in talk.
toddler phase with you. I thought life with you was just about you being like, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. No, don't do that. When you've been longing to get past that phase with me, when there's so much more, some of us, we are in ordinary time right now in our life with God, and we just need the reassurance that nothing is wrong. This is also its own kind of formation in life with God. Some of us are coming right up against those deeper compulsions. We just need hope that you can you're going to dig deep and help us face those. We want more of you, God. We don't want to settle. We don't want to settle for 5%. There's so much more. Thank you for that. Thank you for yes. that. Thank you that you offer to me.